Welcome to Half History Real Travel. I am your host, The Wilder Historian, and in today's video, I want to discuss what is, in my personal opinion, the biggest military blunder of the Civil War and possibly military history. The Battle of Big Black River Bridge. General Ulysses S. Grant had been working since March of 1863 to capture Vicksburg, the last major Confederate stronghold on the Mississippi River. That would place the entire river in Union hands. Trying multiple attempts to bypass the city, Grant ultimately risked his Brownwater Navy by steaming past the city and their artillery emplacements. He had finally reached the riverbank south of the city. Now he could work on outmaneuvering the rebels. On the Union approach to Vicksburg on May 16, 1863, Grant's Army of the Tennessee clashed with Pemberton's mobile army from Vicksburg at Champion Hill. The battle had scattered the gray troops into the countryside. Pemberton and his men limped back toward their fortification at Vicksburg, but knew they would be caught by Grant's fast-moving troops. A soldier wrote, It was slow progress from then until we arrived at Big Black. As it was covered with artillery, the trains of the army, straggling and wounded men, every conceivable conveyance with women and children fleeing their homes and abandoning them to the Yankees, Pemberton decided to make a stand at the Big Black River Bridge. He had three divisions under Generals Carter Stevenson, John Bowen, and William Loring. Stevenson was already west of the Big Black River Bridge, so Pemberton ordered Bowen to set up defenses at the bridge to await Loring, who he expected to be arriving soon. What he did not know is that Loring's division would make their way through the swamps in the opposite direction and join Joseph E. Johnston in Jackson. Grant's forces had won a victory at Champion Hill and the Union General left the hardest fought troops to rest on the battlefield and moved the rest of the divisions forward. The lead elements would be Brigadier Generals Eugene Carr and Peter Osterhaus's divisions. Those two divisions would arrive early on Sunday morning, May 17th at Big Black River Bridge. When Pemberton awoke, he did not see the rest of his army approaching, but that of the enemy. The river made a huge curve exactly where the main Jackson to Vicksburg Road as well as the railroad crossed over. The road and railroad entered the open end of the horseshoe on the eastern side and crossed the river on the extreme western edge. The 60-foot bluffs on the western side of the river were substantially higher than the floodplain on the east bank. This is where the blunder began for Pemberton. Instead of placing his men on the higher ground on the west bank of the river, he organized his defenses on the low-lying east side with his back to the river. Placement on the west bank would have forced Grant to either march his men across the bridge in the face of musketry and artillery fire or find another crossing, which would delay the Union movements and secure the Confederate Army. But that was not the case. Now, Pemberton's defensive line was not weak, but its placement was questionable. Bowen's men hunkered down behind earthworks composed of cotton bales covered in dirt that provided ample protection from enemy fire. The Union Army would have to march through open terrain in clear view of the Confederate Army, except on the north end of the Confederate line which was placed in a cypress thicket. The southern soldiers were ready to defend themselves. Bowen took his strongest brigade under Brigadier General Francis Cockrell and placed them on the right of the Confederate line. The Missourians, although weary from the previous day's battle, were still the strongest force under Bowen. The Arkansas-Missouri troops under Brigadier General Martin Green were placed on the Confederate left. Pemberton did not stick around for the battle. He rode towards Vicksburg before the fighting started, but he did leave behind another brigade under Brigadier General John C. Vaughn, who commanded a Green Brigade of East Tennesseans. Many commanders were concerned with the group from the volunteer state because they came from the pro-unionist portion of Tennessee. Nevertheless, Vaughn's brigade guarded the center of the southern line and awaited the Union advance. Major General John A. McClernand ordered the men of his 13th Corps to awake at 2 a.m., issue rations, and prepare to move out. One soldier grumbled, There is no fun in soldiering. Neither is there any fun on the battlefield when bullets are whistling around our heads, shells bursting and cannonballs and grape shot tearing up the ground all around us. My curiosity is satisfied. The men cooked their slice of bacon over fires with forked sticks and quickly gulped them down. 
At 3.30 a.m., the 13th Corps moved out toward the Big Black River Bridge. Lawler's brigade arrived first, confronting the Confederates along the north end of the line. They were supported by elements of the 1st Brigade of the 9th Division. Extending the line south was Benton's brigade, and then Lindsay's and Garrard's. Once the battle lines formed, an artillery duel ensued. A Union soldier wrote, broadside after broadside came hurtling through the woods. Havoc was terrific among the big trees. Earth and sky seemed tumbling together. Missiles crashed through the giant elms and tore them to pieces. Great lordly trees were peeled and stripped and looked like splintered bones. A shell came so close to Vaughn that it cut the reins of his horse's bridle. Unfazed, his aide tied the reins together and Vaughn continued his patrolling of his line. Union General Osterhaus would be hit by shrapnel while conversing with a captain. He would be removed from the field, leaving behind Brigadier General Albert Lee in command of the division. The 300-pound Michael Lawler was ordered to attack the Confederate left, but was informed by one of his regimental commanders of a meander scar, or a dry portion of where the Big Black River used to run, that could afford a concealed route to attack the rebel flank. He moved his men to go through the bayou to the scar, and then formed his men in order to fix bayonets. The Iowa and Wisconsin troops let out a yell when their commander yelled, Charge! and smashed into the Southerners. Lawler had rode over to the 49th and 69th Indiana to order them to advance and charge with his men. And Iowan remembered, when we leaped up over the bank, a perfect storm of lead was hurled at us, but did not check those that was not hit. The regiment began to toll up the steep bank, but as the head of the column appeared above the bank, it was met by a storm of shot. The movement in that order would have been impossible, and Colonel Merrill, seeing the difficulty, immediately shouted the order, by the left flank, charge, and the silent river overflowed its banks and poured a flood of living men upon the plain, living, yelling, screaming madmen. Upon seeing their comrades break the enemy line, the rest of the Union troops charged, some Southerners retreated for the bridge, and the steamboat which had been converted into a makeshift bridge on the river. However, some simply swam for their lives. Most surrendered, seeing no possible escape. The charge lasted only three minutes. McClernand stated, a victory could hardly have been more complete. Pemberton listed only 20 men wounded and killed, although that number is most likely higher. The biggest loss was over 1,700 Confederates as prisoners of war. Total Union casualties in the attack amounted to 39 killed, 237 wounded, and 3 missing. The Union captured 18 pieces of artillery because someone, and no Confederate would admit who, ordered the horses away from the battle. So the cannons could not be saved. It was a decisive victory for the Union and paved the way for Grant to converge on Vicksburg. Thank you all so much for watching. If you want to vote in the next animated battle map, you can join the Patreon. The link is in the description below. Have a nice day. I'll see you next time.